Um, so we're talking about foreknowledge and free will. And um, twice already I laid out the solution, which is due to the Sadigon and the Akedis Yitzchak and the Rivash and others, that if God's knowledge depends upon what we do, then of course, even though in the real world I did A, and he knew I was going to do A, still, I could have done B because had I done B, he would have known I was going to do B. But that depends upon assuming that God's knowledge depends upon my action. And I said that, whereas I can tell the Rambam doesn't accept that assumption. So he has a different way of treating the problem. And his way of treating the problem is to say that we are dealing with a contradiction between free will and God's knowledge. We should not say that God has knowledge. If you have a contradiction between A and B and you stop saying B, then A is fine. Why should we stop saying that God has knowledge? Because we're not competent to talk about God at all. We're not competent to say anything about God. So one shouldn't wonder, gee, if we're not going to say God has knowledge, are we then saying that God is ignorant? No, we're not saying that either. Because ignorant is just another human term. That's another thing we can't say. So we can't say that he knows. We can't say that he's ignorant. We just have to do something very un-Jewish. And that is, stop talking. <laughs> and then we talked about whether that's not an intellectual cop-out to say we don't know, we can't know. And we pointed out that in science, we very often are in situations where we don't know. We sometimes investigate to be able to find out. And scientifically, there's no reason to guarantee that we could always know, we could always understand. So then there's a sliver of difference in the scientific investigation when you don't understand, you leave open the possibility that you will understand without a guarantee. In our case, we say it's impossible to understand. It might very well be impossible to understand things in the scientific case. You just don't know. And here we say that we know. I don't think that's grounds for the complaint that we have a kind of intellectual kappa. Now, I started to talk about the last point that I want to mention now, but I want to, I want to elaborate on it. It will be said, what do you mean you can't talk about God? Isn't that very extreme? Isn't that against hundreds of different descriptions of God? In the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and in the Talmud and the Midrash, and in the Siddur, don't we describe God all the time? How could you possibly imagine that we're not capable of describing God? Maimonides faces this problem in part one, chapter 54 of the guide. Ramchal faces it in Klala Rishonim in the very beginning, as do many other sources, and they all say the same thing. And that is, we don't describe what God is, we describe what God does. We can describe his actions not his being. And when we say we can describe, we don't mean we can carry out a research project and figure it out. What we mean is that when God reveals to us the things that he, did, that, that he does, we can understand that. The question here is not how do you know. The question is 
do you have the capacity to understand the information? So we definitely have the capacity to understand what he does. And then that means when you find a description in the literature which sounds like a description of what he is, what you have to do is translate that into a description of what he does. So this is, uh, I, would, I would put it this way, there's a three-step process, and I'll describe it to you. And I should say, just from my intellectual background, there is, was, and I think still is, a position in philosophy of science called fictionalism, and that's where I learned this, this description from. But it's clear from Maimonides that that's what's going on. Let's suppose that I have a description of God which sounds like a description of what he is, like he's merciful. So here's the three-step process. Step one, pretend that you should take it literally as describing what he is. So step one would say, okay, he is merciful. Step two, ask yourself, how would being merciful express itself in action? What would he do because of his being merciful? Make a list of all the things you would expect to happen in the world, things that he would do, because of being merciful. That's step two. And step three is subtract step one and stick with step two. Subtract the description that he is merciful and stick with the description of what he does. Now, when you have qualities that have a direct expression in action, by their very meaning, you could see that like justice, like uh, strict accountability, like mercy, uh, like loving kindness, so then the process is easy. You can do it the way that I just did it. You can do it for, uh, on your understanding of the, of the, pro of the uh, process of the quality itself. In the case of knowledge, it's a little more tricky. But I want you to know that Ramchal, Ramchal Lasato, in Klaven Rishonim, on the first page, when he talks about the spheros, and he says the spheros are principles of action. And he gives a list. And one of them is yidiya. One of them is knowledge. He says it word for word, twice on the page. That's one of the things that describes God's action. Now, he doesn't tell you how to get to the scripture, but he's telling you on record that it is. I think we should apply the same three-step process for, for knowledge that we did for mercy. Step one, pretend that he really knows. Step two, ask yourself, how would knowledge express itself in action? And this I mentioned yesterday in response to someone's question, but I want to say it explicitly now. What difference does knowledge make to action? Well, when you decide what to do, your knowledge enables your decision to take into account the information that you have in your mind. So you say, well, seeing that this is what happened in the past, and this is what's likely to happen in the future, and this is where people are situated now, when I do something, I want to take into account the relationship that what I do has to all of those factors. So knowledge enables you to coordinate what you do with the facts that you know. So for someone who knows, we expect his actions to be coordinated. Now step three, subtract the knowledge and simply say, God's actions are coordinated with all other features of the world to which they're relevant. They are coordinated that way. How are they coordinated that way? Don't know. I have no clue. He does it somehow, but not with knowledge. He does it some other way. So um, that being the case, we don't say that God knows. If we don't say that God knows, then they can't be raised a contradiction between God's knowledge and for and for uh, for knowledge and for our free will, but they're not going to say that He knows. So that's a way of dissolving the problem. Friends, I can tell. I keep quoting this tshuva of the Rivosh that I saw. But I can tell that those are the only two ways to face the problem. Accept the proposition that God's knowledge depends upon our actions and solve the problem. Or don't accept that proposition and then take the Rambam's route that we can't describe God altogether and that being the case, we can't say that he knows. Both of those, I think, are 
adequate ways to deal with the problem. A problem for which you have two adequate day, ways to deal with it is a problem over which you don't lose a lot of sleep. So that's what I have to say. Are we, are we together? You understand mm -hmm. what's going on? Yeah. Um, so just like a very basically, what do we understand by knowledge? Because that perhaps would allow us to, to, to apply the, the, the second system of if, if, if it's um, somehow related with the OK, uh, let me say a little bit more. Your question is, I, 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 I was debating whether I should say this or not. There's a way, but Maimonides says this pretty clearly, uh, there's a way to understand why we can't say anything about God. Um, there was a philosopher who thought this up in the 20th century. It became very uh, uh, popular, called the category mistake. But here's the idea. Take any word in a language that describes something. The thing that it describes will be in a certain category. And the descriptive term you're using will apply to things in that category. If you pick something in that category and try to apply the descriptive term, it'll either be true or false. Take something outside of the category and try to apply the descriptive term, and it won't be meaningful, because the descriptive term only works within the category. So I'll give you some examples. Let's take blue. Blue is a term that applies within the category of physical objects. It's physical objects that can be blue. So uh, that book over there is blue. This table is not blue. But this table could be blue. You could make it blue. No, I mean this one over here. No, no, I know. Yeah, OK. So, so blue applies to things like the table. It's just that sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false. But now, yeah, but, but now um, let me ask you this. What color is the number six? The number six. Sorry, that's a non-starter. Because the number six isn't the physical thing. Now you can do it the other way around. Some numbers are prime. That means they're divisible only by themselves and one. Some numbers are composite. Is this table prime or composite? Answer, got the wrong category. Prime and composite are terms that describe numbers. This table isn't a number. So the category, so, so the, the, t the term doesn't apply. Now, pick anything you want that you think about in the, in the world. It, comes, it, comes in, it belongs to some, a certain category. All the language of that category applies, and, lang and, language outside, and, the, and uh, something outside doesn't apply. Well, God isn't in any of our categories. He's not a physical object. He's not an abstract object. He's not a concept. He's not a relationship. So, you know, he's not a quark. God isn't in any of our categories. That's going to knock out all of our descriptive terminology. It's just not going to apply. That's one way of seeing that you can't, um, you, you, you can't use our terminology to talk, to talk about God. I could say more, but maybe that's enough. Okay? So, so it's not going to help to analyze knowledge and see what it means. Maybe we could turn it into... Any, and any category, whatever is knowledge or whatever it is, you just can't apply it. Because our words, yeah, right. our words knowledge, apply to people. Cool. Some people dream that they apply to computers. They're wrong, but uh, you can hear where they're coming from. But to something which is not a person and not a computer and not a dog and not a, and not a concept and not a number and not, not a relationship, and not, so then all the ter all, that uses up all of our vocabulary. And no vocabulary is left. OK. But, yeah. I mean, but also there, there is a, let's say, avamina, like what people had in mind specifically to, to think about uh, God's knowledge. Like it's not, between all the categories, they chose specifically God knowledge and others too, but like, no, this the, the, for the Rambam, he, 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. He says in the guide that we're not picking knowledge specifically at all. We're talking here about the problem of God's knowledge and free will. So here he says to you, you have to know that you can't describe God's knowledge. But in the well, guide, he says it applies to everything that you could think about saying about God. None of it is describable. None of it is literal. None of it makes any sense. He didn't pick knowledge specifically. He happens to be talking about knowledge here. And the guy, we have to, as I said, we have to conclude that God has no qualities. None. Not courage and not kindness. And not, he even says you can't say that God exists. He even says you can't say that God is one. Because all of them are human concepts and no human concepts apply to him. None. He's not picking out knowledge specially here. Okay. Um, so he says, we don't, we, we, we can't know uh, about God. Aval. Noda belosafek, we know without doubt, shema'aseh adam biado, biado adam, a person's actions are within his own control. Does not decree, nor does he push him, pull him, cause him to do one way or to do another, or to do something or to not do something. And he says, and this is a kind of remark that remember makes many times. Now, certain academics who I, I just I can't they can't get off you know can't get out of out of the cradle uh, on these things. But listen to the Rambam's words. They'll say he doesn't really mean it, and he wrote it for publication, and everything else. But listen to his words. It is not known only from religious tradition. This idea, not known only, means. From religious tradition, it's known, and it's known. Religious tradition produces knowledge, but not only from religious tradition. The analysis of wisdom brings you to this conclusion also, meaning a non-Jew who doesn't have our tradition should be convinced also that this is the case. He said, no mar, and that's why the prophets tell us that a person is judged on the basis of his actions in Tovim Ra, because as he said before, if you didn't have free will, it would be unjust to punish and impossible to reward uh, the person for his actions. All of the content of prophecy depends upon this because almost all of it is either... Um, Exhortations to do the right thing, and uh, warnings not to do the wrong thing, and also um, predictions of reward and punishment. And none of that makes sense if you uh, if you don't if you don't have it. Okay, now, if the next chapter he deals with a, a different type of problem, a problem not a philosophical problem, but internally, if you look at various verses in the Tanakh. The verses look like they contradict this idea. And then we have to be able to explain what those verses mean. There are many verses um, in the Torah, meaning the five books of Moses, and the words of the prophets, which appear to contradict this principle. Most people are tripped up by these verses. Now, these people are in a tough spot because they're from. They believe. They're committed to the tradition. They want to live in terms of our, our, our tradition. 
And they read these verses, and the verses sound like God does decree that a person should be, should be righteous or wicked. And then they feel that, on the one hand, there are these problems about thinking that we don't have free will. But on the other hand, if I deny these verses, I'm not following the tradition. This is the holy book. This book has this written in it. So they are really in a difficult position. These are honest people, uh, people who want to do the right thing, and they find themselves faced with a terrible contradiction. I will explain to you a great principle from which you'll be able to understand the content of those verses. When it, at a time when a person or the people of a city chotim sin v'ose chait v'ose chait chota this transgression that the person did, he did through his own free choice, his own will, as we explained. Sometimes after that has happened with his own free will, he deserves a punishment. Because Baruch knows what kind of punishment is appropriate for him. There are some types of transgressions for which the right punishment is in this world. Begufo, Abomamono, in his body or his, or his possessions, or his children. Das, Mitzvos, this is something I can't explain. I'm not going to explain it now. His children are like his possessions. Kosuf, ish becheto yumas, aji yasa ish. Person has to become a, a, an adult. That's one type. One type of transgression deserves punishment in this world. Yesh chet, she did no saying. She defroy me metal all of abo. Some transgressions should be punished in the world to come. In all of the shum nezek belomze, and he will have no one negative consequences in this world. That's one of the reasons you see people who do terrible things and don't get punished, because the punishment is something that's appropriate to give them in the world to come. Some transgressions get punished doubly, partly in this world and partly in the next world. Now, When do we say that these punishments apply when a person didn't do tshuva. Ava lebasa tshuva, a tshuva ketris lifnei aporonius, aporonus. Tshuva is like a barrier standing in the way of punishment. Okishem shaadam chote beritzano, just as a person transgresses with his own um, decision, with his own knowledge, doing tshuva also something that you, that you understand with your, with, your, with your understanding, and you make a choice, and you do tshuva. So there, nothing's been answered yet. This is all background. This is all background. So the person has free will, and there are various types of punishments, and he can stop the punishment by doing tshuva. Now, let me make a remark here because I, it's, it, this is related to something I said once in the past. In chapter 1, the Rambam quotes a Mishnah in, in Yuma where he says that transgression is divided into four categories. First category is where you fail to perform a positive commandment. For all but two, tshuva finishes the story. Person does tshuva, there's nothing left. The sin is wiped out. The, the two exceptions are circumcision and sacrificing the paschal sacrifice. There's a much more serious uh, consequence of, of, the, of omitting those. But for all the others, tshuva just wipes them out. 
For a simple negative command, like don't eat cheeseburgers, or don't steal, don't, uh, well, but say for this also, don't steal, or um, don't plant mixtures of seeds, just a simple negative commandment. Um, tshuva prevents negative consequences from happening directly, and Yom Kippur wipes it out. By the, when I say wipes it out, I'm referring to what's called kapara. Yom Kippur, kapara, same word. It cleanses, it wipes it out. If, however, there's a negative commandment that carries a serious penalty, like death by divine causation, what's called misvidei shemaim or kores, then in order to wipe it out, you need tshuva, yom kippur, and suffering. That's the kapara process. That's the cleansing process. Now, according to what the Rambam said, and I read to you three minutes ago, that's not to be called punishment. That's to be called cleansing. Because he just told us, here in chapter 6, that a person does tshuva that stands as a barrier against punishment. A punishment means you're still guilty. You punish guilty people. A person who does tshuva isn't guilty anymore. But he has a stain on him. And that stain has to be taken off. So the suffering that the person undergoes in this case isn't punishment. And in fact, Ramchal, Moshechan Lutzato, and the Silas Shorim, the Path of the Just, says one of the features that we've spoken about in, in tshuva is charata, regretting the past. Now, I'm sure that all of you have things that you've done that you regret. And when you think of them, you have that sinking feeling in your stomach. Oy, why, did I, why did I do that? And, and, you know, and it hurts. It hurts. Ramchal says that the pain of charata, the pain of regret, can be this pain of cleansing. So there's no contradiction between the two of them. The fourth category is where the person commits a, a severe crime which has, to, in addition to the crime itself, desecrates God's name. And then you need tshuva, yom kippur, suffering, and death. So as I said at that time, what tshuva guarantees is that you leave the world clean. You leave the world clean. But there can be the need for suffering in the world to cleanse the person from the consequences of what he did. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is that tshuva stops punishment. So now, what we have to understand uh, is that tshuva is given that quality by the Creator. There's nothing inherent here. It didn't have to be that way. As you'll see, that's going to be crucial in, the, in, this, in his, his solution to the problem. He gave tshuva that status so that, if you will imagine a case where a person commits a crime and there are considerations which would mean he should be punished, and because he has free will, there's the possibility that he will do tshuva, then you have a dilemma. Because if you want to enforce punishment on the person, well, if he does tshuva, you won't, you won't enforce the punishment. Now, the way that it's put colloquially is, well, if he'll do tshuva, you can't punish him. But you can't punish him doesn't mean you haven't got the power to punish him. It means, given your own commitment that tshuva is paramount, given your own commitment that tshuva never fails, you can't carry out your own decision to punish him if he, commit, if he, if he uh, does tshuva. Because that was your, your own hierarchy that you set up. Under those conditions, Ramadan is going to say, God will take away the ability to do tshuva. Given the priorities that God has set up, that's the only way out. And then when the verses in the, in the Tanakh say that God takes away tshuva, that's what it means. It means the person made his own free decision to sin and also not to do tshuva. And therefore, he needs the, it's appropriate to punish him. And then, if he 
will do tshuva, he'll escape the punishment, but that's, that's a wrong outcome. And that's why God takes away the, the, the ability to do tshuva. After a certain accumulation of guilt, then the punishment is, is necessary. Now that's, that's the thing. You want to say something? Yeah. I mean, just to go from trying to, to see uh, in certain, let's say, a schizophrenic person. No, no. A person has to apply the person to ha- A person has to, be, has to be of sound mind and body before he's held responsible for anything that he does. Right. So then he's not guilty. He didn't do anything that makes him guilty. Right. You, you, so you don't have the premise that he ought to be punished. No, no, but, but, but then how would people uh, ap- apply the law to a person which, you know, has no free will? Again, the law would say, don't punish him. The man's law. Right? The Torah's law. The Torah, the Torah law says that if a person has no control over his actions, he's not responsible and you don't punish him. But what do you do with him? What do you do with Pity him. And if he's dangerous people, to other people, then lock him up so that he okay. won't hurt other people. You but you don't punish him. him. Right. right. That's all. Right. Indeed, for, for, the, the, for the earthly court to punish a person, what has to happen is you have to have two witnesses that observe the crime, and he has to be warned. You're doing something that's forbidden, and it carries a punishment. And he has to answer. I know, and I'm doing it anyway. Without that, the law does not require him to be punished. Because maybe he doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe he's not in, con- not in control. Maybe he's out of it, you know, sleepwalking, whatever it is. Is there an self kapara substitute for kaparas? Is there a way to do kapara on yourself? Is that what Hashem wants? Like, I've heard of sometimes people will roll in the snow as a yeah. form. Uh, he's, he's asking whether a person can do kapara on, his, on himself. Uh, we do have a tradition like that. You're absolutely right. Rolling in the snow and other things that people do to themselves because they feel that they've done something which requires suffering as a kapara, and they would rather do it voluntarily than have it visited upon them. Now, I, I don't think they're looking for an easy way out. Some of the things they do are quite extreme. But it's a sign of, let me see if I can, uh, how I can put this. Uh, let's, let's, let me go back. Uh, let's say we have, we're in category three, and it needs suffering in order to, do, to cleanse. So the question will be, when the suffering comes, how does the person take it? So there's a phrase that's used in, in Yiddish, zol a kapara. Let it be a kapara. That means the person saying, I accept this because I'm sure that I've done something, or could, let's just say, I could very well be that I've done something that needs suffering in order to cleanse, and I want the cleansing. I want the cleansing. Like a person will say, I want surgery. I don't want to go through life crippled. I don't want to take a chance with my life. I want the surgery. Eye surgery is painful and dislocating and dis- disruptive. That's quite right, but it's better than dying. <laughs> it's better than being permanently disabled. <laughs> so here's a person who says Zolzani Kapara. One step beyond Zolzani Kapara is to perform it on yourself, Lachat Chiva. Is to say, I know that I need this. I know this because I need, I have less to stain in my soul. And I, I'm not just prepared to accept it if a Baruch Hu brings it upon me to have that cleansing. I want to do the cleansing myself. I think that's a, that's a superb, uh, superb expression of your commitment to the system and commitment to your own uh, possible failings and wanting to, to do the best possible thing. So we do have such a, a tradition that what you say is true. Yeah. But following that tradition, how can we actually interpret and know that we, should, we do require a kapara to perform upon ourselves, to do upon ourselves? Like, uh, like it, it wouldn't be also like turn out to be a sin because you are uh, hurting yourself or doing something that might be... Uh, like, uh, this is, uh, you know, so you're, you're saying maybe you're not right, or maybe you're being too strict with yourself, and, and then it would be a sin. Um, I 
Let's take a person who has a mild history of heart disease in his family. He has six uncles, and one had, had a heart condition, and one had arrhythmia. Two out of six. So he says, well, I don't know whether I have any uh, heart weakness or susceptibility. I don't know. But I don't know. So I'm going to do exercise. I'm going to eat right. I'm not going to drink, eat salt because I don't know. And maybe. That's not unreasonable. But you're hurting yourself. Serious exercise hurts. I know. <laughs> right? and, and, you know so, so, so why would you do that? Because I'm doing it because I don't know. If I knew that I was healthy, I wouldn't do it. But because I might not be healthy, so that's not, that's not uh, in, in, inappropriate. That's perfectly rational. So you hear per, to a person, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've done things that are, that are wrong. Some of them may be serious. And I, and I may need suffering as a cleansing. It's not, it's not in, uh, irrational for him to put himself through this kind of suffering. Now, of course, the, he, has, he has to be careful because there's a, there's a sim in the Shulchan Aruch which is entitled... Who are those who sin by fasting? Fasting is one of those things that people do. And the, the Shulchan Aruch says, uh, you're worried about your sins and you want to fast and so on and so on. Make sure that this won't reduce your ability to do the other mitzvahs. Excuse me. If you decide to, to, to fast and the, for the afternoon you have to lie down and you can't come to the basement and you should learn, you can't go to the hospital and visit people and you become short-tempered and so forth and so on. That's not what God wants from you. So you can't do this in such a way as to detract from the other types of divine service that you have to perform. But if you're strong enough to take it, then to take it on the doubt that maybe you, that maybe you need it is the kind of precaution that we would take in, in all of life. So I don't think there's anything, anything wrong with that. You know, it, it's similar to Baltashas. Baltashas says, don't wantonly destroy things. But that doesn't mean you can't destroy them. It depends on whether it's wanton or not. Suppose that you have, huh, there's a puzzle that says this. Suppose you have your refrigerator and your refrigerator is full. Some of the food is old. It's edible, but it's old. And now you have new food that you want to, that you want to keep fresh. It's okay to throw out the old food because it's that or lose the new food. And something's going to be lost. So that's not that. Now, there's a verse in the Torah which says this. In the bracha, it says, I forget exactly where it is, Yoshan mipnei chadash totziyu. The new harvest will be coming in. You'll have had such a bountiful harvest last year that the old grains are still in the storehouse. And you'll take out the old grains so that you can store the new grains. What are you going to do with the old grains? You don't put them in the storehouse, they're not going to be fresh. So the Shemi Shmuel, from a Hasidic point of view, says, since you don't need them, you can sell them cheap. And since you sell them cheap, you will attract non-Jews to buy your grain. And when they come to buy your grain, you'll be able to have an influence on them. You'll be able to explain Torah to them, explain to them what they should be doing, and so forth and so on. So that's why it's a bracha. Otherwise, why is it, what kind of bracha is it that the Torah is telling you going to be in a situation where you waste food. It's not obvious why that's a blessing, why that's a, such a good thing. But, but the point is that taking it out, I say, well, wait a second, this is food. And it's being kept fresh in the storehouse. Take it out of the storehouse, it won't be kept fresh. That's right. But then I have a new food. So I have to put that in the storehouse. I have to take this out. Okay, I think that, that makes the point uh, clear. I hope so. Anyway. Okay, so that's, but we haven't solved the problem. What about the verses that say that God takes away free will? Now, yeah, now he comes to it in, in, in the third paragraph. It's possible that a person should commit a very great sin, or lots of little ones. It, the judgment before the judge of truth is that he must be punished for these sins. These sins that he did with his own will and his own understanding. Keep saying that over and over again. Then, the din is, 
mimenu hatshuva. He's prevented from doing tshuva. Ve'emenichelo rishus l'shuv b'risho. We don't allow him. We don't allow him to do tshuva from to re, to repent from his from his sin, from his wickedness. Kedei she yamus v'yaveid v'chataim she'asa, so that he should die and be lost through the transgressions that he that he uh, uh, committed. So uh, he's in such a situation where there's no hope for him. We're talking about a very extreme case where according to the sins that he's, that he's permitted, he should simply cease to exist. He should die and cease to exist. The Rambam holds that certain types of sinners have no life in the world to come. They lose that. Their, their souls simply cease to exist. This was a famous controversial issue. The Rambam says it without any apology, consistently throughout all his writings. The Ramban says, no, it's not possible, in the Shah Ragmul. The Ramchal, whom I quote so often, is split himself on the issue. Some of his works say that a soul can disappear, like the Derech Hashem. And some of his works say that a soul cannot disappear, like the Pesach HaChavadas. I have asked Ramchal scholars about this, how to understand him, and I've not gotten an answer. They, it seems to be puzzled. Did he change his mind? You have to know which works were earlier and which works were later. Or did he have some reconciliation in his mind that we are not aware of? <coughs> this is a controversial issue. The Rambam holds that such a person, uh, that a person can lose his right to exist altogether. So now, the din is that what he's done should require that outcome, even for such a person. If he does tshuva, he'll escape it. Because tshuva is top, paramount. Why is it top? Because the Kodesh Baruch decided it should be top. That nothing should be able to overwhelm tshuva. Then the only way out, given the Kodesh Baruch priorities, the only way out is to prevent it from doing tshuva. Now, first surprise. Who shall Kodesh Baruch Omer, Isaiah said this to Jews. Somehow I have heard people say, yeah, God would do this to non-Jews, but he wouldn't do it to Jews. But it's not true. Isaiah came, yeah, Isaiah came with these words from God. Let this nation's heart be fat and its ears be heavy. And, and uh, darken its vision. Lest, lest the following terrible outcome take place. What is that? He'll see with his eyes, he'll hear with his ears, and his heart will understand, and he will do tshuva, and it will, and it will um, cure him. I don't want that outcome, says God. So let his, eyes, let his ears be stuffed, and let his eyes be dim, and let his heart be dulled, so that he won't do tshuva, and he won't escape the punishment. Uh, the people um, disgraced. Now, the word he uses here is what we would translate as angels of God, but they are, in fact, prophets. It's one of the words. Prophets are sometimes called malachim. They, um, they treat his words with disgrace. They make fun of his, his prophets. Adalos chamas Hashem. To the point where God's anger applies to his people, ad le to the point where there's no cure. Well, but truth is a cure. No, but there won't, there won't, there won't be this cure under those conditions. Kalomar, chotu beretzonam, he keeps stressing this because that's the background. The first of error that the first transgression they did, they did with their own free will. The darko lifshoa. And they, they, Vahirbu the Shoah, they magnified their um, rebellion, rebellion against God. To the point where the punishment has to be made certain, and the way in which the punishment is made certain is by preventing them from doing tshuva. Shehi hamarapfe. That's what, um, that's what it would have been the cure. Now, finally, it comes to the famous case that everybody knows. 
I will strengthen Pharaoh's heart, meaning I'll make his heart so hard that he won't be able to do tshuva. Lefi, he, he sinned on his own originally. The Israel, he did evil to the Jewish people who are living in his land. Let's have a plan to deal with the Jewish people. The, the, um, the, ju- justice required that Tshuva be denied him until he could be punished. That's why Kodesh Baruch Hu strengthened his heart. Okay, there's more to be said about the Pesukah. I'll just leave you with a thought. Uh, this is very well known, very well publicized, very well discussed. I want you to try to think of another way that those verses could be understood. Because the Rambam is not the only one who explained these verses. And there are others who explain the verses. God hardened Pharaoh's heart in a way that's consistent with free will. That does not mean taking away God's free will. In fact, Nachmanides does explain it that way. (coughs) Try to think on your own. When I first read Nachmanides, I thought, wow. Here are the verses. And uh, the story's well known, and everybody thinks about it in one way, and it never occurred to me that the very same words could be understood in the opposite way. So see if you can figure out how to understand these words that God hardened Pharaoh's heart in such a way that it doesn't take away free will, but it in fact strengthens free will. I'll start with that tomorrow.